Now, there's another um, thing going on this month. Uh, anybody remember? What, what's? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday, right? We're going to celebrate birthdays today. Oh, actually, it's not, that's next week, right, for the birthday party. But anyway, we're going to celebrate whose birthday? Jesus. Jesus, the Messiah, right? So, happy birthday, Jesus, right? Yes. So, uh, let's let's bring that uh, spirit back up. You know, a lot of times it's, oh yeah, I got to go shopping. I've still got my Christmas cards to send out, and you know, sometimes it feels like it's more of a burden this time of year. <laughs> let's remember the reason for the season, right? Jesus Christ, Jesus was born. So, we're celebrating the birth of Jesus because he came as the second Adam, right? A true man and the Messiah. So, uh, last week we talked, uh, um, I went over and reviewed why is Jesus' birthday so important? Why is it so important to celebrate the birth of the Messiah? And number one, we know that in spite of all the wild things that were going on, and even many people who were much more famous and and well-known at the time of Jesus, the person whose life, three-year ministry, made the most profound impact on human history was Jesus' life. So why did why is that so significant? And we taught basically the fundamental nature of who Jesus was. Now this is what the Jewish people were, were expecting. It said, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. <clears throat> Jesus came as the first true human being. You know, we, we spoke about that. Jesus pioneered the way, broke through the way for human beings to actually live out as genuine human beings, the way we were originally created to be. Yesterday we had a great discussion in our Divine Principle um, uh, breakfast and seminar time. I, I, I really encourage you, if you have a chance or opportunity, join us on Saturday mornings, 9 o'clock till noon. We have a breakfast together, sit around a table. Uh, sometimes we do presentations, but yesterday we just discussed, and we discussed for a long time particularly about how we understand and experience God and also the, the relationship that we have with the Messiah. And one of the guests who was staying, you know, relatively new to studying the Divine Principle, you know, asked, you know, history has been so difficult. We think about how many years of evil there's been in the world. How is it possible for us to get out of this mess? It's just, it's really not possible. It's just like, we're stuck. And this is why our understanding about the nature of the Messiah and our relationship with the Messiah is so important. As, as we said uh, last week, you know, Jesus, as a true human being, has divine value, unique value, there's only one, and cosmic value. And because of that quality, that value of who he was as, as a, uh, God's representative on earth, history could be transformed. And so this is what we're recognizing and celebrating. Uh, here's how... Um, um, so the question <laughs> that comes after that is, well, if the Messiah is so important and we need the Messiah so desperately to be able to bring healing, why did it take so long? You know, according to, to uh, biblical years, we're talking about maybe 4,000 biblical years, but we know that from the archaeological record, we're talking maybe millions of years since uh, Adam and Eve, the first uh, human ancestors. So all this time went by. And we know from God's, uh, from our understanding the principle about who God is, God is a suffering parent. So what parent, when the child is in trouble, waits a few couple million years before trying to solve the problem? <laughs> no. No, God, right at the beginning, and we've studied the, the history in the, the Bible, God at the very beginning is trying to solve the problem, even within Adam's own family. That's the story we talk about with Cain and Abel. But God began right away to send the Messiah. So the question is, you know, why does it take so long for God to send the Messiah? And this was the question that, that uh, our guest kept asking. He says, you know, why is it so hard? Why, 
Why are we living this? What kind of God would let us have this kind of evil world? So, what's the answer? Aha! There's the key ingredient. Thank you so much. You've been good students. Human responsibility, right? <laughs> we know we can count on God, but the problem is, is what humans do. And this is such an interesting thing, an important point of unification teachings is understanding that God has given us genuine responsibility. God made us to be co-creators with God. That means we can't be just robots. We are creative. We invent things. We make things happen. God designed us to have, actually to be divine beings. The incredible power to create. So God made us His co-creators and not only that, He wants us to be His partners. Partners with God in creating the kind of world that we're living in. A good world. <laughs> Unfortunately, the world that we're living in is a consequence of what we've created. It's amazing when we understand the genuine power that human beings have, that God has given us as human beings the power that we have to bring change in our own lives and change in the world and the environment around us. Challenge is, is that when you're in a partnership, God has to wait by His own rules, His own laws. He has to wait for His partner to do His part. God has to wait for us to do our part. It's like I know a lot of days, times in school it's uh, popular to have community pro uh, projects. You know, we have a team that's working on a thing. And that's great if you have good team members, right? Everyone, they're doing research and, and you, you like to give each person the thing that they're the best at, right? And so you have a project. You know, there's, there's four of you working on the project. And there's one person who's just kind of, yeah, I'm not so interested in this. I don't really care. I don't need a good grade in this class. Right? And everyone else is working really hard. I mean, it takes a, it's a huge project. It takes a lot of time and energy. So everyone else is working on their project. But then this one component isn't done. <laughs> Anybody ever experienced that? You know, when you're, you're working together as a team and then there's one person, or maybe it's two people. <laughs> but anyway, they're not pulling their weight. And the problem is, is that you can't get the job done without them doing their part. So God is stuck by His own design. He says, by the rule, everyone has to participate. And if they don't participate, you know, when we hand in the, the, the grade to the teacher, says, okay, I need to see each person's part. Wait, wait a minute. I don't see this part. You, you, you don't pass. The whole group. Until that one person. So God needs us to do our part. Our portion of responsibility. So in God's providence of restoration, God's providence to bring healing to the world, we know that God's always been right there trying to give us a chance, always giving us opportunities to grow. But over and over as human beings, we fail that responsibility. If we look uh, just, just quickly at uh, history, here's some words from uh, Father Moon. He says, To find Jesus, heaven went through all kinds of hardships from after the fall until his arrival. In order to attend this one man, Jesus Christ, the chosen people, that's the Jewish people, went through a road of unspeakable persecution and the road of death in their historic course. They repeated numerous times the history of struggle where they fell down, stood up, stood up, fell down, and stood up again. This is the providence of restoration. The God's working throughout history. Well, the very beginning, remember the first story about the, the family in the Garden of Eden? Who's the first family? Adam and Eve and their children, Cain and Abel. We know the, the challenge there. God sets it up, a relationship, but Cain and Abel can't unite, don't unite. Cain kills Abel and God's providence is delayed. It was their responsibility Abel had to love his brother, win his brother's heart, and Cain had to overcome his jealousy and resentment. Because they weren't able to do that, then the province was delayed. And then the next big event that we see in the Bible is Noah. Noah's family, and building that ark, really faithful, making a strong, powerful condition to bring change. But then when his family, still problems, so even that's lost. 
And it took until Abraham, Abraham even didn't fulfill his part, but it was extended for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it was finally through Jacob and Esau that finally God had the condition. Finally God's partners had done enough so that God can claim, by God's own rule, the foundation has been made. But then there was more delays because the world wasn't ready at that time. So we see the history. 400 years, the chosen people, already chosen. God is going to send the Messiah to these people. They have lots of prophecy about that. But the first 400 years, they spend suffering and slavery in Egypt. Dying, incredible persecution and suffering. Well, at the end of that time, who comes? Moses, right? Moses leads them out. Kind of, he pioneers the way of the Messiah. He's not the Messiah, but he shows the model for the course that the Messiah can go. But even that, leading them into the promised land, they still spend another 400 years under the leadership of what's called the judges. Like uh, the, the first one, uh, Joshua, led the people into Jericho. Right? And then there's uh, Samson, and there's many different uh, uh, of the judges. Until finally, the last of the judges, Samuel, anoints a king, King Saul. So, God now has a nation. A nation that he could send the Messiah to. And he would, through the three generations of Saul, David, and Solomon, God wanted to be able to send the Messiah at that time. But because of the failure of those in leadership position, those, that portion of responsibility, God's partners let God down. And so, that was lost and the province was delayed even longer. We see another 400 years where Israel is divided into north and south. And there's just lots of stories in that time. The prophets, most of the major prophets come from that time period. Can you see all the time and energy that God is investing in making the foundation so that finally He could send the Messiah, so finally He could send Jesus Christ? Even after that 400 years, still they haven't made the condition. So there's another 70 years where they're taken into captivity into Babylon, and then 140 years to come back. We call it the 210 years of the uh, Babylonian captivity and their return. And finally, at the end of that time, they rebuild the temple. They, they start getting their laws in order. There's a lot of reform happening within the, the synagogue and within the, the, the temple. And yet still, there's another 400 years while the world is prepared for Jesus' coming. God invested so much that the world will be ripe and ready for when the Messiah came. This is why it's so significant for us to, to, to think about what God had to do to be able to send Jesus. How powerful and how important that moment was 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ could come and could be born. We look at this this path. You know, it was two almost two thousand years that it took the chosen people before they could finally do their part, before they finally fulfilled their portion of responsibility. In in, in exact biblical years, it was one thousand nine hundred and thirty biblical years from the time where the chosen people went into the land of Egypt until the time when Jesus Christ was born. But then, at the end of this long time. And again, as a parent, you don't want to put anything off. You want to get your children out of trouble right away. But because God's partner didn't do that our part, we didn't do our part, it kept being delayed and delayed and delayed. So when finally the day comes, hallelujah, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This is a huge moment in God's history. The joy, the angels are singing, <laughs> the universe is so happy and rejoicing because finally God has a landing place on the earth. He has a true human being born, just like Adam. A true human being without, without sin. Now Jesus goes through the process of growth. This is the true victory and joy w that we want to celebrate today. Thinking about those incredible years I mean, the almost 2,000 biblical years, but how much longer was it actually, including Noah and, and Cain and Abel, that it took before God could finally, finally send Jesus Christ, the true man on earth? So, here's uh, uh, what uh, Father Moon says about this. When God found Jesus, his purpose for choosing Israel was fulfilled, was to be fulfilled. 
when God embraced Jesus completely, He was embracing the chosen people of Israel, all the people who'd suffered so long, all that history. When God could dwell joyously with Jesus, He could dwell with the people of Israel. It was the work of God to find Jesus in total fulfillment. This was the hope, this is the mission uh, uh, of the Messiah. Amazing time that we're celebrating right now. An amazing thing. So, part of our discussion came up uh, yesterday in our Divine Principles. So, yeah, so why do we need the Messiah? Can't we just do it ourselves? And most of us, we can look at ourselves and say, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not, doing it. I'm not doing it myself. I'm, I'm having plenty of struggles as it is. And that doesn't mean we don't have a lot of work to do. But we need someone to open the gate to break down the barrier that's kept us from realizing our full potential. So the first thing that the Messiah needs to do is he needs to break the pattern that Adam and Eve established to create that good family that God can work through, not, not the confused kind of families that the reality that we experience. So the first thing the Messiah does is break through that barrier that no one has been able to break through. How precious is that for God? How wonderful it is for us that there's hope, hope in the world because we have someone who's broken through. Someone also who can guide us and help us fulfill our purpose in life. Right? Remember the three great purposes? To become a person of true love, to create a family of true love, and to have dominion over the things in the creation. A uh, true, loving dominion. Be a true caretaker for things of the, cre- of the creation. So, here's uh, again from the divine principle. As an individual, each one of us is a product of the history of the providence of restoration. To this end, I must fulfill in my lifetime, that's each one of us, through my efforts, the indemnity conditions which have accumulated through the long course of the providence of restoration. All this time, all the history that's gone before us, we, in our own lives, are in a position to heal that, to break through that, and to bring change. So how do I fulfill my responsibility? Well, our first is our connection with God, right? Our portion of responsibility is our foundation of faith, is that reestablishing that connection with God. Let's invest. As we end the year, it's a good time for us to reflect on the year, make a determinations about the, the next year. So let's determine to be people who bring victory in fulfilling our portion of responsibility by getting serious about our prayer life. Serious dedication of time and energy and effort to connect to God, our Heavenly Parent. To connect to the source of power and energy. An investment. To invest in study. You know, daily, Hundake is our tradition. You know, the daily studying of Scripture and discussing and, and growing. So we're feeding ourselves spiritually. Also developing and practicing our self-control and self-discipline through making conditions and, and, and sacrifices and, and determinations. So this is our foundation that we're making uh, of trust and connection with God. And finally, let's uh, use our talents and skills for the benefit of the people around us to make a positive change in the world around us. This is our initial foundation ourselves. But in addition to using those talents, developing self-discipline, and a powerful prayer life so God can genuinely dwell in us, we also need to make a difference in the relationships and the people in our lives around us. We call this the foundation of substance, making things real in the world around us. Well, that starts with having proper kind of relationships with people, paying attention to to how we're relating with each other. And the core place we start is with my physical family, right? But not just my physical family. We have my spiritual family, which is our church community. And even larger, expanding out to our neighbors, our community, people we know at school, at work, investing in making a difference in our relationships around us. We want the world to know that God is able to be real because they see what we're doing. They see our actions. Let's be people who make an effort, commit to helping others 
you know, making a positive difference in the lives of the people around us. And even, uh, uh, and very fundamentally, because we have an understanding about God's providence and restoration, we know how God is working in the world. Not just in my own life. Not just in our church. But actually through organizations at the worldwide level. Nations and governments and principalities. This is the, the challenge that uh, God is facing. Can he find faith? This is why at the um, event that we had on, um, that, uh, in Korea, we had ambassadors from peace from all different walks of life. All different kinds of ways. Not just Unification Church members. It's not just the Unification Church that's going to make this change. We need to be the people that act as the catalyst to give power and energy and true perspective to those, these many uh, great, powerful ambassadors for peace who are doing so much to make a positive difference and a positive change in the world. I want to close with this uh, uh, quote from Father Moon. For each one of us, you are a son of God or a prince or a princess of God. In order to deserve this title, you must learn to think as God thinks. Live as God lives. Be concerned as God is concerned and love as God loves. So to think as God thinks, let's study. Let's understand Let's always seek to train our mind to see things from God's perspective. To live as God lives is for the benefit of others. Making a positive difference in the world around us. Just as God gives everything unconditionally to God's children, let us be those kind of people who are able to give unconditionally to others. Care, be concerned, as God cares for everyone, no matter what their circumstance or situation. And finally, to be people who manifest God's love and make God's love real in the world. Please join me in prayer. Father, Mother, God, our, our loving Heavenly Parent, we are so grateful for the amazing blessings that we have and the uh, opportunity that we have living in this time in human history there is so much challenge, so much turmoil, and yet so much hope because true parents are on the earth. Heavenly Parent, we want to be the people who can share that and share the vision and hope that you have that no matter how difficult or bleak or challenging circumstances be in our own lives, in, in our family, in our community, even at the world and international levels, Heavenly Parent, Always you have a vision, a hope, a way to move forward to bring healing and to bring peace at every level. Heavenly Parent, at this time, at this Christmas celebration season, we are so grateful for your Son, Jesus Christ, for His life, for His love, His absolute commitment and determination. <clears throat> we pray that our celebrations can lift and comfort His heart, that He can find joy in us breaking through the barriers that have plagued human history from the very beginning. So as your sons and daughters and as blessed central families, we offer this prayer and ourselves again to you. Amen, amen, and adieu. Okay, thank you very much. Please uh, turn to your neighbor and uh, share.